Hi there, thank you, John. Um, as you see, I'm not uh, I'm not Christian Ardley, but um, you all know me. So um, let me go. How do? Huh. Where's the next thing? Okay. So um, why do we want to use FFPE samples? Clearly, there are a very large number of sample data banks and, and tissue banks in the biorepositories worldwide. So these are in FFPE. These samples are often have a rich clinical information and historical, pathological, and uh, uh, follow-up clinical data. So we want to use this FFPE. And that could, if we could use FFPE samples, that could fill the accrual gap in TCGA, and particularly the future of TCGA. And we heard Lou Stout say, we need to get to 10,000 patients per tumor type. So if we need to do that, we need to go to FFPE if we don't want a 20-year project. So another reason we want to move to FFPE is because these remain the standard clinical practice when you take biopsies and, and uh, samples out of patients. And if you want to put clinical sequencing into you know, the, the clinic, basically sequencing into the clinic, you want to be able to work with FFP. So there are challenges working with FFP. There are, uh, of course, it's difficult to extract from the samples. You need to uh, deparaphanize them and decrosslink de the protein and DNA. The physical size of the samples within the paraffin block is sometimes small, and there's the yield of the DNA that you can generate out of them is, is problematic. There's clearly poor quality of the DNA that comes out of it, as you can see from these kind of uh, smeared uh, um, uh, gel runs. You can see that the FFP uh, DNA fragments are, are, are broken compared to what you can see from a fresh frozen. So here, for example, the size problem. And in TCGA, uh, a nationwide children's hospital separated the, the blocks, the sample sizes into three categories, the large tissues, the medium, and the small tissues. And, and if you go to clinical samples, you could see small tissues, very small tissues, tiny tissues, and don't know where the tissue is. So uh, that, that's, uh, um, this is kind of what you could get from clinical samples. So what data sets we have? We have um, uh, TCGA prostate uh, for FFPE tumor samples and the fresh frozen tumor and the, and the blood normal. We call these trios, as, and this is, this is kind of the icon depicting that. We have the tumor from the frozen, the tumor from the FFPE, and the blood normal. And when we call mutations, we can compare the tumor to the, nor the frozen to the normal or the, or the FFPE tumor to the normal. There's also breast trials, which I actually won't talk about today. And there's lung cancer data that we, we have uh, from the broad 17 FFP tumor normal pairs. Here we have both the FFP, both tumor and normal, and the frozen, both tumor and normal. So this, we, these are kind of quartets. So I will talk on both of the prostate and the lung. So what are the questions we want to answer? There are seven, six questions that I want to answer in this, in this few minutes that I have. So can we get high quality exome sequencing data from FFPE samples? Can we detect mutations in FFPE samples and are they artifacts due to uh, kind of uh, the, the fixing uh, procedure? Uh, can we detect copy number uh, data based, uh, based on um, exome sequencing of FFPE samples? Are we finding the same mutations in those trios or quartets between the FFPE and frozen? Can we perform a cancer genome project using FFPE samples? And finally, can we use those FFPE in the clinic? So are we getting similar library sizes? So what you could see here is actually the coverage on FFPE versus the frozen. And uh, in these kind of cases, actually, we sequence deeper the FFPE. So you could see actually the coverage is a bit higher in the FFPE compared to the frozen. But in, in general, they, are, they, they look uh, um, even better here, the FFPE, because we sequence them deeper. For, um, for library size, actually, the frozen has a, sl a slightly, I mean, actually double the library size. But even 100 million molecules in library size is well above what we need in order to sequence deep. So there's no problem in getting a deep enough library to, to sequence. Here we can talk about the coverage on frozen versus FFPE. And you can see these are all the targets that we try to capture. And these are different, uh, these are the TCGA prostate cancers. And you can see that most of the targets that are captured well in the frozen are also captured well in the FFPE. And the ones that are not captured well in the frozen are not captured well in the FFPE. So it looks kind of consistent. And this is kind of the coverage criteria of 14 and 8 reads in the tumor normal. The same thing we see for the lung cancer. So the coverage is not an issue. 
Then in terms of the number of mutations that we find. So in the four prostate samples, the frozen, when you do this comparison of the frozen, we find 135 mutations in a total territory of 130 megabases. And in the FFP, 137 mutations in 130. So you know these are very similar numbers. In the lung data, we find uh, 5,332 mutations in the, FF, uh, in the frozen and 5,013 in the FFPE, and the territory is similar. So it seems like we're finding similar number of mutations. What are the pattern of uh, the spectra of mutations that we're finding? So here's the prostate and the lung, and as you can see, the FFP is the blue and the frozen is the red. We find the same spectra of mutations. So not only the number is the same, the distribution of mutations are the same, meaning that they're not dominated by some artifact caused by the fixation, because otherwise it won't follow the distribution of real somatic mutations. So we are, we are happy that there are real no artifacts in FFP. Can we find copy number changes? So we are using an algorithm we, we developed called CAPSEG that generates um, copy number from, seg uh, from segmented copy number from uh, uh, capture data. And here what you can see is actually there's, it's before segmentation. Every point here is a, is a target uh, exome. Uh, and, uh, and you can see here the copy number. Here's an example. You can see the frozen and you can see the FFP. They look pretty much the same. Uh, actually, there's a region here that doesn't look the same, and I'll talk about it in a second, what, what does that mean? But there's a, there's, here's the frozen and the FFP. The, the noise level look the same, so we, we feel that we could do copy number from FFP as well. So now the big question is, are we finding the same mutations? So when we look at those Venn diagrams, those 3,000 versus 3,300, we, we actually, this is actually from actually 19 lung samples. So we see actually only 44% overlap. So what's going on? Everything looked good and now we see only 44% overlap. That something is weird going on here. The same thing we see actually prostate is even worse. So now we think about it and we come to, a, to this fundamental observation that we all need to understand. And this is the biggest take home message from this talk is that when we do this comparison, we, we, set, we do, we, make two different changes. One is FFP and one is frozen. This is what we want to com uh, compare. But the other difference that, we, that exists is that this is one part of the tumor and this is another part of the tumor. And when we compare different parts of the tumor, they have different purities they and then they have different subclonalities of mutations and things like that. So, and we can't distinguish between the two. There are, uh, there's FFP, so now how could we analyze it in a more careful way to, to really do the comparison between the FFP and the frozen? And this, this kind of pro problem affects any comparison, at DNA level, RNA level, methylation level, protein level, any comparison will, aff will be affected by these problems. So just to remind you, this is a slide that you've all seen from me many times, when you call mutations, you, the ability to find mutations depend on the allelic fraction of the mutation, which depends by itself on the purity of the sample. And then given the allelic fraction, the number of reads, the coverage in the sequencing tells you what's the probability of finding the mutation. So if you have two different pieces of the tumor, that one has one purity and the other one has a different purity, you don't have the same chance of finding the mutation, even if it had the exact same, if it was clonal, basically it appeared in all cancer cells in one side and the other. And indeed, when we look at the samples, the reason that we don't find, so for example, some samples have reasonably the same purity and we find most of the mutations in both of them. But some samples have a very different purity between the FFP and the frozen. And then we basically don't find any of the mutations. Either they're red or they're all blue. And, and, thi and this is what explains, so we need to look sample by sample, explains those differences. So how do, can we do it in a better way? So j j there's another problem. Everything could be clonal mutations, but what happens with a subclonal mutation? So a subclonal mutation could be different proportion in one side or the other, or does not exist even in one side or the other. So we need to distinguish between clonal mutations and subclonal mutations. So we have a method called absolute that can actually distinguish between clonal mutations and subclonal mutations. And in fact, in ovarian cancer, half of the mutations are subclonal. And in, in, it's similar in, in many other cancers. So how can we compare frozen to FFP? First of all, we don't really need to call the mutations independently in, in one of them. So once we find the mutation in FFP, we could ask, does it validate in the frozen? 
And for that, we don't need to use the high strict cr criteria that we use when we call mutation, because we only test a few sites. So we might need only to require two reads or three reads or, or a few reads that support the mutation to validate the mutation. Then we need to correct for the different allelic fraction that exists between the two different samples. One are frozen and one FFP could have different purities. So we need to fit these lines to these little scatter plots that you saw before. Once we fit this allelic fraction, we need also to calculate the power to validate based on the coverage of the sequencing. And we could look at the power to the 80% power line, or the 95, or the 99 power line, and then say, distinguish between sites that we could not validate between ones that don't validate. There's a big difference, cannot validate and don't validate. And then, finally, we need to distinguish between clonal mutation and subclonal mutations. So if we do all of that, what's the picture? So uh, let me skip those two slides, on, which tells you how many reads actually you need in order to validate? For example, if you have a mutation at 5% allelic fraction, in order to have 80% power, you need 60 reads to have 80% power to validate it. And if you have um, uh, to validate, meaning to see two reads of the mutation in another sample. If you, if you want to see it five times, you need 135 reads to, uh, to see the, uh, the mutation with 80% chance. And if you, reach the, if you want to use 95% power, you need 93 reads for a 5% allelic fraction or 180 reads. So you need deep coverage to really be able to validate. So what happens when you take all these kind of things into account? The green uh, um, bar here represents what we validated. The red, what we did not validate at sites that had a, more than 80% power. The, the gray represents those sites that we didn't have power. So previously, we divided the green by the total uh, bar. But now we need to divide the green just by the red green by the, by plus the red. And as you can see, when we look at lower and lower allelic fraction, we, we actually see that the, uh, the number of gray, the, the size of the gray, is actually larger at low allelic fraction. This is if you use all the mutation. If you use only the clonal mutations, you can see that the green is even higher because those are mutations that are predicted to be clonal. All these low allelic fraction mutations are actually subclonal mutations that we don't expect to be in the two sides of the, of the samples. The, if we do 95%, it, it even is, is, uh, is more dramatic and the, and, the, and the success rate goes up. So here, look at this line, which is very faint. But if you take only the clonal mutations and use the 95% power, you see that actually they are very close to 100% that we find the mutations in both sides. So actually, we can use FFP and in, in in for, in for samples to find mutations. It's just that we need to be careful in analyzing them. Finally, can we use that to, to do uh, genome sequencing and run uh, cancer genome project and run MUTSIG? I'll just say that, yes, we find the same list of significant genes. And this is an old version of MUTSIG, but the same list in using, when using the frozen and the FFP. Can we use it for clinical? Yes, when we look at all these known cancer genes in, in the lung, we find them in the FFP and the frozen. So, so it could be used for clinical sequencing. So finally, the conclusions. Um, we could perform exome sequencing on FFP. We can calculate the overlap between FFP and frozen sample controlling for the clonality and the coverage. Uh, mutation rates are the same. Uh, uh, Subclones uh, kind of contribute to the differences. We can perform cancer genome projects using FFP for sequencing at least and copy number based on exome. We could use uh, it in the clinic and we need to have more samples to really reach the kind of final conclusions. There's still more challenges for whole genome sequencing. The low yield is also a problem. As you saw, there are very small, tiny samples that we need to, to address. And older blocks are problematic because roughly 10 years ago, the people changed from using a, a buffer, an, an unbuffered to a buffered formalin, and the unbuffered for, uh, formalin was uh, kind of problematic to the DNA, RNA. So roughly things from 10 years ago and, and beyond would be better. So just I want to thank Kristen Ardley, which also kind of, uh, uh, is kind of expert in extracting these samples and understands all about uh, uh, um, FFPE, and uh, Peter Stoyanov, uh, Andre, and Scott for doing analysis. Thank you.
That's obviously an extremely important uh, question. Wish we had more time uh, for more of the detail. Is there one quick question? Yeah. Yeah, this problem of small clinical samples is the rule rather than the exception. Um, what is there any possibility to amplify? I mean, and if so, how does that change copy number of mutations? I know it's a huge subject. Can you just say never do that, or it's possible? I would prefer to say never do that. We, we, um, <laughs> That's the, what the, I was afraid. The, the reason that I'm saying that is because um, uh, we, the technology to go to lower and lower input DNA exists, and we could sequence down to a lower and lower. Now the standard is 100, 100 nanogram, but we could go lower than that, and that's the way we need to, to invest rather than, than, uh, than amplify with kind of uh, weird artifacts of whole genome amplification that we have before. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.